Good evening and good morning and good afternoon, wherever you are dialing in locally from all over the world. We are here in Munich at the Intel Ignite office and I welcome everybody here in the room and outside over there for the second uh, European AI Summit 2022. We have an incredible lineup of very interesting people today who would like to share some information and knowledge and expertise about artificial intelligence from every aspect that you can think of. We have um, venture capital people representing the investment community. We have startup entrepreneurs. We have serial uh, CEOs and founders who have already built some companies. We have a very interesting government representation as well. And we have, last but not least, uh, research institutions uh, also telling us what's going on in that area. So with that, uh, we are on a very tight schedule. And I would like to, first of all, thank uh, Marcus and the uh, Intel Ignite team for hosting us here. I really appreciate that. Uh, everybody who has helped put a lot of time into this um, effort. And uh, with that, I would like to start with um, Adam. Uh, my partner in crime for these events, and we have been on the road for days or for weeks now. And with that, um, let's start over the presentation where Adam is talking about uh, what he is up to in literally all over Europe. Yes. All up to you. All right. Thank you, Tom. So hello, everyone um, online and also uh, here in the room. Uh, yeah, very quickly. My name is Adam from Startup Network Europe. We do uh, events all across Europe. Um, so, for example, we have um, myself, a picture here. Uh, we do events in Germany, such as the uh, Germany Startup Conference 2021. Uh, just yesterday or two days ago, we did the German Startup Conference 2022. Uh, we also do um, the Berlin uh, Product Conference 2022. We did that two weeks ago. And we do events all over Europe. Um, so for example, tomorrow I'll be in Ireland. I've done events in the UK. I've done events in uh, in Amsterdam, uh, all over Europe really. And one event that I'm really looking forward to actually is uh, in December, I will go to Ukraine. We will host the first ever European Startup Conference. So if there's anyone in there in the room who wants to help Oops. promote that event, uh, just get in touch with me. Um, my name is Adam Fulham, connect on LinkedIn. It would be great to talk. I'm the marketing guy, Thomas and all the people here, they know about AI. So I'll leave the rest of the event to you. Uh, really looking forward to it. Thank you. Oh, this is for you, Marcus. So with that, I would like to give over to uh, the host, Intel Ignite, and Marcus, it's all yours. Yeah, so welcome everybody. Good evening, good morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, super happy to host this event. There's a delay, sorry. Um, and why is it something that was close to my heart when Thomas approached me with AI? When I started looking at um, decks and startups a couple of years ago, um, everybody was talking about AI. All the domains had dot AI, yeah. And I then, if I looked a little deeper, I coined this phrase, yeah. If it's on PowerPoint, it's most certainly AI. If you dig a little deeper, if you look into the code, it's max machine learning. <sighs> Maybe it's just if this then that, yeah. Um, but this has changed. Uh, I can tell you. Um, I'm now running the Intel Ignite program, so Intel's global uh, startup initiative uh, in Europe. And um, what do we do? Yeah, you can read it here. We accelerate early stage deep tech startups. We do it non-dilutive, so that means we don't take equity. We don't charge anything. It's completely free, giving back to the ecosystem. And it's from founders for founders. And um, when we look at the decks, um, it has changed, but I'll come to that in a, in a second. The whole program is um, a global program, as I said. Uh, we are active in Tel Aviv for Israel, in Munich for Europe, so that's, that's what I run. Um, quite recently, we started in Boston, so Transatlantic is also taking place. Yeah, And we are also now making the effort to go over the, the smaller pond. So next year, we will start in London. Uh, the first batch is there, so really looking forward to also be even closer connected to that ecosystem. Um, what is Ignite about? Um, we want to build the home for the best early stage deep tech startups in the world. Yeah, so Intel wants to be connected to the disruptors of tomorrow again, I would say. Um, and it pays off already. So we are doing this now for two, two and a half years. Uh, we've been looking at a few thousand or a couple of thousand startups, um, get really great NPS, 
we get great uh, successes from the teams and we measure ourselves against the success of the startups. So we are only successful and we even get only paid or we get paid accordingly um, if the startups are successful. The proxy for that is funding, obviously. Yeah. Um, and we were quite successful with that. But we made one big mistake because we defined a couple of segments where we look at teams and one of the streams was uh, AI and machine learning. Um, and boy, were we wrong. Yeah. yeah. It's not a separated track. It's a track that goes across all these categories. You can see here on the left, um, we barely see a team without AI. We barely see a team where it's not baked into the core of the proposition. Yeah. So there are some teams that are doing purely ML or AI, but most of the teams do it across the categories, whatever they work with. So uh, a really cool development. If I go back to the five, six, seven years ago, it was only on PowerPoint and in domains. Yeah. This has greatly changed. And we can even see that is, this evolves further. So we now see neuromorphic chips. We see AI baked into hardware. Um, super specific, so um, this is getting really, really interesting. So that's why we're super happy to host this conference today. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you very much, Adam. For the audience, I have to tell you, you don't want to be in this room right now. It is a sauna here. It is hot in here. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, let's get right into uh, the introduction of maybe myself and the transatlantic AI exchange. Um, that was something uh, that I started around 20 months ago. So it's actually fairly new. And I think actually we have a slide on that one. Okay, here we go. So let's talk a little bit about it. So we have in literally 20 months um, put together 21 events. Uh, me personally, my name is Thomas Neubert, as you can probably imagine from the name, I am 100% born and raised in Germany, in a state called Nordrhein-Westfalia. I lived in Munich before I lived, I moved to Silicon Valley, I followed a job offer that I got for one year, and that was 31 years ago. And uh, I, I love Germany, I'm always back, going back and forth, but I'm also super passionate about two things, connecting people, bringing Germany into the game. And um, I also love connecting people around the space of AI. And I agree with Marcus, AI is, in my humble opinion, something that in a couple of years, so maybe a little bit longer, it's similar to the term water or electricity or the internet. We will not talk about it anymore. Right now, we have to get going. We have to ecosystem. We need to be built. But whatever is on top, the use cases, the solutions, that is what we will talk about in a couple of years. So uh, with that, I personally spent um, pretty much half of my life in building startup companies and uh, international subsidiaries for German companies in Silicon Valley and vice versa. The other half of my uh, career, I actually spent in the corporate world. I was for many years the VP for Deutsche Telekom. Uh, for innovation and partnering in Silicon Valley. And six years ago, I decided to join another small company called Intel. So in Intel, I'm with an incubation program uh, in the area of data center and artificial intelligence, hence my passion and background about um, gaining more knowledge in, in this particular topic. So 20 months ago, some, some, something happened uh, almost on accident and a light bulb went on when somebody showed me a paper which is called AI made in Germany, something that you can read it's on the Internet, you can upload it, it was done for and with the German government. Um, I like the, 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 the starting thought of what is there to come and that's when uh, some other people, including myself, decided to help and kickstart the whole program in building an ecosystem. That's why we are here, as you can see on the slide. We have now a bunch of partners. Um, I want to thank very much again, Marcus for Intellignite for the facility, but also the German consulate in San Francisco, as well as uh, the German entrepreneurship who will actually present some awards at the end of this event. They all have graciously uh, sponsored this event to make it happen. So. Adam is a partner of, in crime with me. Uh, he's an excellent person when it comes to building European networks and events. 
and I think there is a very interesting synergy between us. And uh, this is now our fourth event in 10 days, pretty much. In London, two in Berlin, and then one in Munich. So excellent. Um, I want to just quickly spend one moment on an award that we have, uh, that we will give out in January. And it's for all the startups here in the room, behind the glass in this room, but also online, um, wherever you are. If you are liking and following Transatlantic AI Exchange on LinkedIn, and if you have attended one or two sessions online, physically or hybrid, then you will uh, can participate in an award that we are giving out in January. And as you can see here, we are taking some money against uh, tickets to Silicon Valley. And if somebody who wins that ticket, I will personally commit that it will be worth that individual's or that team's time. I will uh, personally uh, mentor and show them around in Silicon Valley. We can talk to incubators. We can visit Intel's headquarter. We can spend a whole day in mentoring and business plan and go to market, all of that stuff. So if anybody has an interest to do that, um, please check us out and, uh, and, and sign up for it. Last but not least, um, we started with pretty much virtual events only, and we will do that on a monthly basis. All the events we have done so far are online. Uh, they can be watched for free. Um, our, our events recordings are actually enabled by an AI platform, uh, meaning that if you search on a nice interface with a few words being it the speaker or a buzzword, um, it will get you right into the text script as well as into the video. It's a very nifty a company called uh, Clipper, who is providing the service. So we have some uh, upcoming events already planned. Um, one is about uh, models and how to use models for artificial intelligence and inferencing. And then we have uh, Web 3.0 on our agenda. And then we have two other, three other things already in the works for next year, but that wasn't ready to be shared at this point. So we are trying to be uh, on time with the first section of this uh, pretty, I call it speed dating event, because everybody has a very you know, tight schedule with one message within like four minutes. With that, I would love to excuse you guys. You can get into a, into a different room with a different temperature. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, very smooth way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to kick somebody out, <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank you very much, appreciate it. And if the next speaker is, if he can get ready, if he arrives, uh, please let me know. All right, yeah, that was a smooth transition, I have to say. Um, so let me move over to um, the, the, the flow for the next hour or so before the next physical speaker is actually using a presentation that I'm actually looking at it right now here. So first of all, we talked a little bit about what uh, transatlantic AI is. Uh, we, we are calling it Tykes, T-I-A-X, to, to be a little bit more shorter. Um, but what I would like to do is I would like to introduce um, the next two speakers. And uh, the next two speakers are in the section of research institutions. And there's obviously there's a lot of research institutions, the Fraunhofer Institute, the DFKI, and, and many others here in Germany. They're doing incredible projects. Um, we are working very closely with uh, a lot of them. And uh, in this particular case, we have uh, Greg, he is uh, Greg LeBlanc. He is actually dialing in from remote. He's in Silicon Valley. Uh, Thomas, Sahar. if I can uh, interject, Greg has not made it yet, so I would say we start with Sahar. Okay, so I'm, I'm here. I'm right here. <laughs> oh, just on cue. I, I'm, I'm, I've been waiting for my cue. Perfect, Greg. I appreciate that. So, so we have two speakers covering the representing the research uh, sector within AI. Again, I have Greg Gregory LeBlanc. He is the he's a lecturer at HEC, Stanford University, and the University of California, Berkeley, and he's the host of the Unsiloed Unsiloed podcast. Um, and recently, I had the honor to talk about AI and cultural differences and incubation programs and stuff like that together with him to a, a very big, well-known German car manufacturer. Um, and there were some executives, they wanted to learn about things in, around AI. 
and I listened to an absolute phenomenal presentation that Greg gave about models and use cases. And most people, believe me or not, if you ask them what AI really is, most people can actually not really explain it. And God forbid to understand what you can do with the models and how you implement them and how you did you find the problem. And Greg has an incredible presentation that he's teaching at Berkeley. And I invited him today to join for just a few minutes to give you a glimpse. But I also would like to point out that by November 29th, I actually have reserved an entire hour virtual session. So please sign up for Greg to talk about it and educate people about um, about that. Um, so I hope, okay, here we go. Okay, so oh, he, okay, so he has some some content. And after that is Sahar, Sahar uh, Bartman soon. She's the director of the DVIH, which is the German Center for Research and Innovation. And Zahar is also very close to where I am in Silicon Valley, and she's based in San Francisco. So Greg, uh, take it from here. All right, please. great. I think I think I only have about ten minutes. So um, I, I less thought, than ten minutes. Yeah, I thought it'd be best just to give you a, an example, right? A case study of how uh, data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence can give you some quick and easy wins, but also to emphasize that the data science piece is, is useless if you don't have the right leadership and the right management. So I thought I'd tell you this a little bit about me. There we go. I thought I'd start with Michael Bloomberg. So Michael Bloomberg was the mayor of New York City, you may have heard. Um, and when he joined the city, one of the first questions he asked was, who's in charge of our data? Now, the reason why he's interested in data is because, you know, this is how he made all of his money. He became an extremely wealthy person on the back of, of data. He understood the importance of data. He understood that if you're going to be a player in the financial markets, right, you need to have data. And so when he became the mayor of one of the largest cities in the world, which is a huge multi-billion dollar organization, when he asked who's in charge of the data, he was a little bit surprised when he found out that there was no one in, in charge of, of the data. And so it became really um, clear to him how important it was to change the way the city was being run, because right after he got elected, uh, there was a big fire uh, up in, in Harlem and a, a bunch of people died. Right. And so he, he brought the head of licensing and inspection into his office and he said, hey, listen, you know, this building uh, it killed all these people. And, you know, when we went in and looked at the rubble, we discovered that there are all sorts of legal violations, right? There were no sprinklers, there were no fire extinguishers, right? It was violating all of these laws. So why didn't you find it? Why didn't you detect it? If you had detected these violations earlier, these children would still be alive. And, and so what the uh, licensing inspection person said was, hey, listen, mayor, there are 800,000 buildings in this city and we only have 50 people. So it's going to take us a thousand years to go and inspect all the buildings. And so if you give me more resources, if you give me more people, if you, you give me more money, then I can inspect more buildings and I can save more lives. Now, this is what every business leader does. They ask for more money. They ask for more resources. And, you know, Mayor Bloomberg was too smart for that. So he said, no, no, I'm not going to give you any more money. I'm not going to give you any more resources. You've got to figure out a way to do more with less. And so this guy was a little confused. He didn't know what to do. So Bloomberg asked him one simple question. How do you decide what you do with your limited resources? How do you decide which buildings to inspect? And he said, well, we, we randomize in order to surprise people and keep them off guard. Or we wait until people call in with complaints and then we send people out. Now, this is clearly not the right way to do things if you've had any exposure to economics. You know that what you want to do is you want to rank order the buildings from the ones that are most likely to be in violation to the ones that are least likely to be in violation. Right. So you want to conserve your resources, go for the lowest hanging fruit. Right. And so Bloomberg said, I'm, I'm going to cut your budget and I want better results. Now, this is one of the most simp the simplest applications of data science. And so in my class on data science, the students immediately know what they need to do, which is they need to create a spreadsheet with all of the buildings and all of the historical data, or what we call training data, and all of the outcome variables. So whenever there's been a fire, whenever there's been a violation, that's going to be coded as a one. 
Anything which is not a violation is coded as a zero. And then we throw in all of the different features and characteristics, the age of the building, whether there's been a fire at the building, whether there's been a crime at the building, right? The tax status of the building, the mortgage status of the building, the zoning status of the building, the location of the building, the proximity to fire hydrants, all of these things, anything and everything which could possibly impact the probability of a fire you throw into this spreadsheet, okay? And, and once you do that, then it's just about pushing a button, okay? So it's just about, you get your structured data, okay? You do your training, you do your scoring, and then bingo, you come up with some kind of hierarchy, which ranks the buildings from most to least likely to burn down. Now, at this point, my students who have been schooled up in data science, they know exactly what to do. And they say, give me the data and I'll push the button. And that's when I have to tell them that that's the easy part, that 90% of the work happens before that spreadsheet is assembled. And that requires that not only do you have to go out and find the data, but you also have to clean the data, you have to make sure that the data works, you have to make sure that all the addresses and all the columns are lined up. But probably the biggest obstacle to doing this is not a technical one, it's a managerial one. Because all of those columns that I just mentioned, they're all stored in separate silos. The police department has its data, fire department has its data, tax department has its data, right? Zoning department has its data, and none of them want to give up their data for free. For all of them, information is power, and the only way to get them to give up their power is through effective leadership. Okay, luckily, Mayor Bloomberg was an effective leader and was able to do this. But if you're not a digital native company, you have all these legacy systems. And the legacy systems are technologically problematic, but far more importantly, it's about the decision rights and about the organizational architecture. And so when I teach data science, I emphasize that you have to change the organizational architecture and the decision making architecture of your, of your business, not just how the data is stored and how it is is managed. And so what they were able to do is create, um, one second, was this thing called data share, and uh, and that's how they solved the problem. So- Greg, one, one, thank, yeah. thank you very much. We are, because the 10 minutes you said, it was actually shared with somebody else. Oh, I thought I had- But here's the, good, here's the good thing. Sorry about that. You will have an entire hour, and the entire audience will come back on November 29th, sign up for it, because these use cases, he has so many of them, and they're all so interesting that for many of you, probably within your own environment, a few light bulbs will go on and then you go to the next step. Sorry okay? about that, Thomas. I thought I had 10 minutes. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's you and Zahar. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I just made a big advertisement for you for an entire hour. Okay, there we go. So, Zahar, uh, take it from here, please, right away. Yes, thank you very much, Thomas, always for organizing these great events. And thank you, Greg, for your introduction, for mentioning the impact also of data science and how important it is. As the director of the German Center for Research and Innovation, we um, connect the ecosystems, innovation ecosystems of Germany with those countries where we have these houses. And our newest house is the one in Silicon Valley in San Francisco. And um, yes, um, why is innovation so much related to research institutions? We know that startup hubs worldwide are always near major research institutions. And there are many reasons why, because basic science activities are the foundation of innovation. So this is why we also have in Silicon Valley, we have Stanford, we have Berkeley and many others. Also the broad expertise you find in these hubs, well-educated people, and also the presence of tech companies. And this creates unique ecosystems we have. And this is why we are here in, in uh, San Francisco. Speaking of AI and what we can do is I always, um, get the impression that people say, yeah, Germany or Europe has to showcase more what they have. And uh, the US and especially the Bay Area is so strong in promoting their AI activities. And why do, don't we do that in Germany? And this led to an initiative from the German government 
to um, finance uh, three different AI hubs in Germany, from which one is located in Munich and the other is in Darmstadt and one is in Dresden. The Konrad Zuse Schools for Artificial Intelligence are only one example, because I only had four minutes, um, to present you one of the examples what the German government does to get brilliant minds from the world in different topics uh, related to AI. And although I only have four minutes, I will show you a video of two minutes summarizing very interestingly what these hubs do and um, how you can maybe collaborate with them. Yvonne, can you show the video, please? We can't, I can't hear it. I don't have audio either. I, we don't have audio. That's good that they have. Hmm. So I can talk a little bit maybe as long as um, there is no sound. So um, basically from the next winter semester, master and PhD students can start in one of these three um, hubs. It's a, these hubs are always between universities and corporates in that area. And we have one in TU Darmstadt called ELISA, the Sekai in T, at the TU Dresden and RELI at the Technical University of Munich. These three projects are funded. And now it's talking about ELISA, machine learning and intelligence systems. It's, um, yeah, and with the subdisciplines, um, this is one of the hubs. <laughs> Sorry that you don't hear the sound, but um, we can. You can also see that on the on the um, website. And then we have Sekai, which is the second. They are building their websites at the moment, so it's brand new. This project, so keep an eye on that. Um, and Sekai is life science and medicine, so AI and life science focusing on. And the RELI, which is very important in terms of the impact also focuses on the adaption of AI and society. So I think this is also a very important topic, also trust in AI and so on. So, and the Technical University of Munich has also a presence in San Francisco and is very interested in collaborating with US researchers. And they give scholarships for master students, PhD students to come to Germany to one of to one of these hubs. And what is also interesting, it's possible to make a master and a PhD in a row, so to say, um, in, in these disciplines. They have experts from various fields, interdisciplinary. And this is just one of the examples what Germany tries to do to attract more, more experts worldwide and also to promote it. Because as we all know, AI is affecting basically every, um, every discipline we know in research and also the, the curricula of the different universities implement more and more AI and data science issues in, in different topics. So I can uh, support any Germans interested in, in uh, connecting to the ecosystem here in San Francisco, but also if you are um, US based and interested to get a connection to the German research university research institutions and innovation hubs, you can contact me and I will be happy to help you. Thank you. Zahar, thank you very much. My apology for the technical hiccups, but you did, you managed it very well, I have to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, I see you next week back home and I will owe you a dedicated session on your excellent service on the research representation in Silicon Valley. So we put we put a new different uh, event together later on. So Zahra, thank you very much. Greg as well. Appreciate both of you. Now to the next uh, section, which is the AI leaders in Europe and the US from a government perspective. And I am really delighted to say that I'm very honored to have an incredible person right sitting next to me. And I have uh, incredible people also dialing in remotely. If I go by the sequence here on my notes, the first one 
is um, our dear friend Oliver Schramm, who is the Consul General of Germany in San Francisco. Then we have uh, Timothy Liston. Thank you very much for being here in person. Thanks for having me. He is the U.S. Consul General in Munich. Uh, then we have Holger Hus, hopefully online. He is the co-founder and chair chair of the board of Claire, an, an European-wide AI organization uh, with a very, very huge reach. And he is also a professor for artificial intelligence at the RWTH in Aachen. And then we have Gerard de Graaf, who just actually moved to Silicon Valley and opened the very first office uh, for the European, he's the European Union ambassador to Silicon Valley. The official title is head of office, San Francisco, senior envoy for digital to the US. And he is literally representing the delegation of the European Union. So having been in the Valley for 31 years, this is as far as I can tell, the very first time that the Re European Union is putting a dedicated person in an office in Silicon Valley. I think that's phenomenal. So with that, uh, I would like to give it over to Oliver first, if he is, uh, if he's there. If not, can you, can you hear me? Thomas? Here we go. Yes. Hello. Good to see you. Hi, good to see you and good to hear you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I, it's, it's a real pleasure and it's, a, it's, it's a great, uh, it's great to be back. I know this is the second edition. And I think this is a this is an endeavor very much worthwhile because there's so much going on in both our regions uh, in the whole transatlantic area. And I really thank you, Thomas and Adam and Marcus, for pulling this off once again. And it's a delight to uh, uh, to discuss in one panel with Timothy Holger and Hira also uh, today. And uh, given the given the short time slots that we understandably have been accorded. I would just like to jump into the topic head on and, and, and Zaha has already laid out the picture with regard to research institutions. And I will try to, uh, to um, come with a couple of points regarding what the federal government is, is doing uh, with regard to AI. And I think uh, my friend Hira might, uh, might uh, elaborate on, on something on the European front AI act in the making, et cetera. So uh, just, to, just to kick it off, um, um, the good news is we, uh, the German government in Germany has a comprehensive framework. It exists, uh, it's, it's not so new. So uh, previous governments have already started uh, working on uh, um, developing and expanding uh, um, in the field of uh, artificial intelligence. There are several strategies that the German government has stipulated, updated, and is uh, regularly monitoring. Uh, and uh, there are also the first uh, cases and, and use cases that are being uh, established and incorporated. And there's a, a number of pilots uh, uh, projects that are already being started uh, in different government departments, but obviously most uh, or most interestingly in the field of uh, uh, corporate businesses and the government has set aside quite quite significant uh, budgets to help develop it. So just as an overview in uh, the, I think the three main uh, um, strategies or papers or um, policies that are, have been laying out are one is the AI strategy, which was started in 2018 and it was updated uh, in April, no, in uh, in uh, December of 2020. The second is uh, a newer one. It's the data strategy, which was adopted in January 2021. And the third one is the so-called digital strategy, also by the federal government, which was, which is the most recent one, uh, end of August of this year, it was adopted. And uh, these three strategies, AI strategy, data strategy, and digital strategy, uh, they are, of course, as, as the titles might suggest, very much overlapping. Uh, um, I would say the digital strategy is more directed on domestic use. This is, this is uh, especially regarding uh, laying out more infrastructure, uh, glass fiber uh, connections in, in different parts of Germany, and also establishing 
digitizing and digitalizing uh, departments uh, of the federal government, but also in the in the on on state level in in the lender. Um, I, I think that uh, Kira might expand on what's going on on the on the European front. There has been the White Book in February 2020, and and in April 21. Uh, that was all relaunched in one AI package, uh, several measures, 40 measures and financial instruments, uh, and of course the um, EU regulation on uh, artificial intelligence and another one on machine products uh, that are in the making and might see uh, um, a light of life uh, early end of this year or early next year in a transitional phase and maybe in 2024 come into force, but this may be for later. Uh, just to get started with the German AI strategy, um, I, I mentioned uh, we have already some pilot projects that are, are being implemented. Maybe just briefly uh, to suggest that you know the high, uh, high flying goals that are connected with this strategy. One is to make uh, uh, artificial intelligence made in Germany uh, become a globally recognized trademark or seal of approval. Second goal is to strengthen Germans, Germany's already strong position in industry 4.0 further and to help it become a leader in this area also connected or more connected with artificial intelligence and especially especially with, a, uh, with an emphasis on the German Mittelstand, the German SMEs that are forming the backbone of, of our economy. And the third goal is um, to, and Saha mentioned that already, this is of course connected with uh, some of the goals that the DAAD is, is stipulating, is to make Germany become an attractive place through this investment and through all the initiatives that we are planning to attract the best and brightest heads in AI so far. So the AI strategy, as I mentioned, was adopted in November 2018 under the uh, uh, government under the leadership of Chancellor Angela Merkel. And then in uh, December 2020, the federal cabinet, uh, the, our, our um, government adopted an updated national AI strategy. And uh, it, it's adopted uh, some implementation measures to current developments. Of course, uh, two years is a, is a very long time in, in AI, as you know much better than I do. So it was, it was high time to do something about it. And uh, with this, of course, uh, nothing comes from it alone, just from writing papers. Uh, the commitment uh, to further and to support uh, uh, AI in Germany, in German structures, in research institutes, uh, also with a view to the Mittelstand, means also an increased government investment. So um, that, uh, the, that amount that was originally budgeted was uh, raised from 3 billion to 5 billion euros uh, by 2025. By the way, he was interested in the details of uh, where AI is put to use and where the pilot projects take place. Uh, there's a website uh, um, that kind of uh, um, lists it up or explains what is already underway and where it's used. It's called KI, which stands for AI, Künstliche Intelligenz, Strategy, Deutschland, DE. I'm happy to share later on the link. And it includes also comparisons with strategies of other EU member states or other non-EU countries. And the special emphasis is in this strategy is put on three areas. One is research, recruitment, and expertise. That is mostly what I mentioned when, when, it, uh, when we want to attract uh, bright minds and expertise and experts from other countries uh, to, to Germany. Then transfer and application, and as a third area, area, regulatory framework and society. That of course means we have to have a future-proof uh, um, approach. That means we have to constantly look out to where we have to better, to adopt, to develop further norms and uh, regulatory frameworks where need be. A special emphasis or particular view by our Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Protection. Um, their, their emphasis is very much uh, directed on the improvement of transfer and application. So uh, just uh, with a view to the German Mittelstands, the, the German SMEs, so just a few examples. So supporting more AI training and trainers 
in the middle stand where it's mostly needed, uh, not, less so in the in the big big companies, especially in the 4.0 centers of competence. Then, as a second uh, example, extension of multiplicators, two multiplicators rather, like the chambers of commerce, which we have. We have a, a, a tight uh, network of regional chambers of commerce and to uh, business association uh, as well. Uh, the third example would be um, the organization of more AI innovation contests. A fourth example, startup promotion through a, the German accelerator, which has, by the way, opened its doors again here in the Bay Area in, in Palo Alto in April, and, and also um, with a view to the grant system that the ministry has uh, has started uh, under the title exist so that is for people coming fresh out of university and want to build up their own um, uh, they start their own company then the dlr that is our aerospace uh, institution has an institute for safe ai so more money for them as well uh, gaia x and uh, of course our institute for uh, disruptive or innovative uh, um, developments sprint will also see more uh, more support. As I mentioned, the um, the overall commitment stands at five billion at the moment. So three of those five billions are uh, that will directly go um, into this AI strategy that I mentioned. And another two billion have uh, already been budgeted under the so-called Conjunctur Paket uh, or Future Packet that was uh, agreed in 2020 when Germany uh, tried to put together a package to reboost our economy um, coming right out of the, or with a view to coming out of right of the tunnel of uh, the pandemic. And, uh, and uh, it, most of these 5 billion have already been budgeted and should come to good use. So that is a little overview, a short overview I wanted to give about uh, Germany's AI strategy with a view to uh, the EU, the planned Artificial Intelligence Act, uh, just so much that the federal government uh, that started in December of last year in their coalition treaty already uh, mentions it and, and uh, voices clear support for the EU AI Act and its multi-layered risk-based approach. You might have heard that uh, there's, um, there's a great emphasis put on risk assessment and uh, uh, with its certain different layers and steps of regulatory measures that come with it. Uh, um, but on the other hand, and that's the tricky part, um, the EU AI Act should also be innovation friendly. Uh, it should be easy to implement and it, uh, on the other hand, it should safeguard digital civil rights, and that's always the art and the uh, the uh, the um, the fine tuning work that has to has to be uh, has to be done. Um, on the other hand, uh, same with the GDPR, um, we we believe that the AI Act will also become something of a global standard uh, beyond Europe. Uh, we've seen that in September 21 already the. Congress of Brazil has adopted a bill uh, which comes up with a legal framework for AI as well. So we see first repercussions and I think and I believe that some of the reasons uh, uh, which we very much welcome for opening up an EU office here in San Francisco is to explain and to talk about. And uh, of course, uh, there are also relatively new fora uh, between uh, the EU and the US uh, for, for furthering uh, the dialogue, and also the Trade and Technology Council. Um, so I think those are the places where we compare best practices and, and uh, results and experiences. And uh, um, I think that's the only way forward to really step-by-step step compare uh, results and, and find out the best way forward to be on the one hand business friendly, but on the other hand, not uh, lose out of sight certain um, uh, prerequisites and certain conditions that we need to apply when it comes to AI. So I'll stop at this point. I don't know whether I used up my four minutes, but for the sake of all the other <laughs> ones, <no. laughs> Oliver, thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. Without any further ado, <laughs> um, I would like to give it over to Consul General, Mr. Liston. <laughs> 
Please uh, go ahead. Yeah, Tom, thank you so very much for the um, opportunity to speak here tonight at the second uh, annual, and I hope annual, European AI Summit. Um, I will keep it brief, uh, crisp and short, I promise. Um, and I'm not going to pull the Ronald Reagan. This is my mic. We can speak for you know, yeah, six yeah. minutes. And, uh, and we will go over time. So that's clear already at this point. Okay. <laughs> I will, I'll keep it. And you can, you can keep me disciplined. <laughs> all right. Um, so it's really a pleasure to um, be here as a representative of the United States government. As, as you know, I'm the Consul General here in, uh, in Munich. And it's um, at the risk of being the oracle of conventional wisdom. Uh, we're living pretty extraordinary technological and scientific times, and there's a lot of great progress being made. And that's truly, in general, a great and, and important thing is we're facing so many global challenges uh, that are going to require state-of-the-art technology and cutting-edge innovations uh, to solve. And this technology has been developing at um, almost an exponential rate over the last decade. <clears throat> It's extremely important, and President Biden says this is part of the strategy, strategy of and the transatlantic uh, relationship, is that we work with allies and partners uh, to develop and deploy technology that can help tackle these truly um, wicked hard problems, as my professors used to say, and urgent challenges that we face, for example, climate change um, and threats to global health. That's really where we can look at technology to, to be able to um, address. So. These new technologies, of course, have the have the potential to redefine various aspects of our society, and they're reshaping many, many aspects of our daily lives. And we're definitely going to work with these technologies as we move into the future. And the United States and the EU can can and must take a leading role in defining principles and security standards for the deployment of technologies like artificial intelligence in order to protect our citizens civil rights. And our domestic values in good German Datenschutz would probably come into uh, to, to play here. Yeah. And <clears throat> we have to remain ahead of the curve on this, ahead of change, if we're going to be effective in, in living and working with uh, AI as we move forward. We must also actively support our businesses and the scientific community, science community on both sides of the Atlantic, shaping the technological transformation by providing federal funds setting up appropriate standards and regulations. Building this foundation of trust, trustworthy technology that benefits our citizens is absolutely critical. And there's a critical need and a driving force. This, this critical need is, of course, a driving force behind the European Union and the United States establishing fora like the Trade and Technology Council to discuss how we better collaborate and hopefully align some of our, if not most of our standards and norms as well as rules and regulations. The Biden administration is heavily investing in new technologies, including AI. Through the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative, the United States government ensures the United States will continue to lead in AI research and development. Guiding the United States AI and research uh, investment is the National AI R&D Strategic Plan, which identifies the critical areas of research and development that require federal investments. The purpose of this continuously updated plan is to ensure that our nation continues to strategically prioritize its AI R&D investments, updating our plan as we consider, um, as we consider advanced in, in field of AI and new understanding of AI research challenges. The United States has been supporting and investing the research development and design of new technologies right from the start of the Biden administration uh, because and let me quote my um, foreign minister, Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. We want America to maintain our scientific and technological edge because it's critical to us thriving in the 21st century economy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, we're also concerned about um, how I say this, about the dark side, that protecting our citizens from the flip side of AI, of what is all is good. And that, therefore, we've developed the blueprint um, uh, artificial intelligence bill of, bill of rights it's a civil um, civil rights framework that lays out five principles to help guide the design development and deployment of artificial intelligence and other automated systems in a way that is aligned with democratic values and the protection of civil rights liberties and privacy of the american public now, geopolitically we see an increasing te technological competition that is not something we shy away from 
and especially when it comes to setting standards and norms, as well as rules for how the new technology could be used. <clears throat> the U.S. government has made clear that we have a national security interest in making sure technology, technological advances benefit the American people and our allies and partners to support and promote a global innovation ecosystem of trustworthy technology. One of the many ways we foster the bilateral exchange between the United States and Germany, of course, in addition to engaging with audiences like all of you today, is recurring outreach initiatives established by U.S. Mission Germany called Transatlantic Innovation Week. Maybe some of you have heard, <coughs> excuse me, some of you have heard about it. The program highlights transatlantic co cooperation on a wide variety of high-tech, entrepreneurial, and forward-looking topics, and each year has a different specific innovation focus, with the most recent focus being on green tech and sustain sustainable growth. We are truly looking forward to next year's Innovation Week, in which we hope to see some of you participate and engage on topics, important topics, such as artificial intelligence. Stay tuned, watch this channel, and thank you very much for your, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Consul. Really appreciate it. There's so much to talk about on both sides. Yeah. I would like to give you an open invitation to come back to another separate Tyke session where normally we have sessions for one hour yeah. with three to four speakers and go very deep. Okay. Today, just for the audience as well, and I know we are running late, I will guarantee, um, yeah. is that today is more about scale and it's almost like what I said earlier, it's speed dating. I want to give everybody a taste of all the different aspects of what is going on within AI because it's still somewhat the wild west from every angle. So this was a great overview. Oliver did a great overview. There will be others, VCs and something, but it's just it's just scratching the surface. So the deeper dives, I would invite everybody to give us feedback, what kind of topics are of interest, and then we put separate sessions together. So if you don't mind for a few more minutes, would be great. I will hand it over to Holger. Holger Hus, if you are online, I assume you are calling from Aachen, unless you are traveling. Yeah, I am actually calling from the very heart of uh, Europe, right? Very close to Maastricht, where the Maastricht treaties, of course, were uh, signed uh, in Aachen, from where Charlemagne actually um, basically reigned the first uh, big European uh, Union. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I want to talk about a little bit after um, sort of making a, a statement of why I think AI is actually so incredibly important um, is, is actually neither Germany nor the EU nor, um, nor uh, the US as it turns out, but Canada. Um, and I'll explain to you in a moment why I want to do that. So first of all, we should all care about AI, not just because it's exciting, of course it is, right? But because AI is going to be the driver of future progress in science and engineering. And to the point that we think that our prosperity and that our ability to solve global problems that we all share is relying on science and, science and engineering, they will rely on AI as well. Um, the AI ecosystem in Europe is strong, but uh, fragmented. Uh, the, there's good AI expertise in academia, but uh, it's, it's not particularly well organized and, and uh, uh, basically exists in, in pockets that are relatively weakly connected. There's a high AI readiness in industry, which is very good, particularly in countries such as Germany, the Netherlands, Nordic countries. Um, but we are quite weak in AI valorization. Um, there are notable exceptions. I'd like to just mention one because it's a personal favorite of mine. Uh, there's a German startup company, DeepL, that uh, took on Google and actually emerged as a global leader in automatic translation of natural language. If you don't believe it, go there, check it out. I have no vested interest in them, but I use them all the time because it's great technology available for free. Um, so why Canada? Well, it turns out that um, the Canadians did something pretty amazing. Uh, in 2018, earlier than most other jurisdictions, they rolled out what they called the Pan-Canadian AI strategy, funded at a whopping 125 million Canadian dollars. So that's less than 100 million euros or US dollars. So, so small money. But they actually did some very smart things with that money. They focused it almost entirely on research excellence and talent attraction. And they developed and executed their strategy mostly by a non-profit research organization with a track record in AI called CIFAR, um, rather than having the Canadian government do it by themselves. The strategy that CIFAR rolled out was based on the insight that in AI, more than in most other technologies, the, the path from lab to market is very short. 
And there is opportunities and also realities of very rapid tech transfers from the universities uh, out into the startup and, and the more established industrial ecosystem. And therefore, they, they uh, conjecture that investing into university-based foundational research uh, actually gives you the best bang for the buck. And they bet the entire 125 million on that. Um, and it turned out really well. Montreal has emerged as a result of that as a hotbed of talent and activity um, of really global significance, right? And they pursued a superstar model where three national centers were constructed in Montreal, Toronto, and Edmonton around top researchers with, uh, with a global reputation um, that was built in, in, in part on existing CIFAR programs as well. Um, and it worked out really well for everyone involved. In contrast, the EU strategy has an AI effort that in my personal opinion and that of many people in the European uh, research community and also uh, innovation community is, is perhaps a little too focused on regulation. There's certainly um, an insufficient amount of investment into the AI ecosystem in terms of the amounts and the instruments used and the investment is rather diffuse um, and, and so that doesn't really help the ecosystem to become defragmented. I think we can learn from Canada here. We should focus in Europe more on newsworthy AI activities, more money into fewer initiatives. Um, we should focus on proven research excellence. I can't believe that there's still no ERC program on AI. Actually, Germany has gotten that right. I have to say I benefit from this because I got one of these Alexander from Humboldt chairs that bring in um, researchers from AI researchers considered excellent back into Germany. That's a great program. It has been super successful. Um, and it's really something that should exist at the European level as well. Um, and finally, there should be more of a focus on curiosity-driven research in the public sector, because I'm firmly convinced that industry will follow, right? You, you create hubs of AI talent creation uh, and, and AI activities uh, around universities. We've heard about this earlier as well. Uh, this is essentially how Silicon Valley um, started being successful, right? And this is how it worked in Montreal as well. Uh, we need to do that in Europe much more as well. And uh, with that, I've used my four minutes. I hope you enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Holger. I tell you what I like a lot. A, you stuck with four minutes, <clears throat> but most importantly is you always get very straight to the point and it's very tangible, the message that you are sending. And I can tell you, listening to, looking at the audience, there was a lot of nodding like, yes, <laughs> he's knowing what he's talking about. So thank you very much, Holger. Um, Gerard de Graaf, uh, if you are online, it is uh, your time to share your expertise. And welcome Thank to Silicon you. Valley. We never met officially yet. Thank you very much, Thomas. And I mean, it's it's nice to be here at a, at a decent hour in San Francisco. Most of my meetings and participation in events in Europe are kind of really early morning. So this is a, a very good uh, start. I, I, I wanted to kind of say three things, actually, because in four minutes, I mean, there's so much to say and so little time to say it. So I think the first thing about the European Union is we need to get our act together. And I think the previous speakers have already identified that I mean, Europe has a huge potential, but we're not exploiting that potential well enough. There are obstacles, hurdles that are holding us, us back. And I, I hear a lot, and I think Professor Ho said it, like about the AI Act, uh, because that draws a lot of attention because it's the first in the world. But I would like to say as a first point, the EU needs to get its act together. And that isn't just in legislation, it is the whole portfolio of actions, we are being out-invested. So we need to make sure that we have the conditions in place, both in the private and in the public sector, to invest more. In the public sector, it means we need to coordinate, because there's otherwise the risk of fragmentation and, and sub-scale investments with the member states. So that's what we're trying to do. We need to invest in research and development. We need to have more graduates, more kind of ICT skills in, in AI. I mean, I am still very much surprised that in, in many member states, um, I mean, it is difficult to, to, to find master courses for AI, to get PhD positions for AI. The UK has more master courses, more PhD positions than the EU as a whole. That's a problem. In my country that I know best in the Netherlands, there's a numerous clauses on AI students simply because there's a capacity problem. So we need to do a lot better. Regulation is part of it, but it is not all of it. The European Union is not going to thrive because it has AI regulation in place, but we need to make sure that the AI which we have in the European Union can be trusted. It is trustworthy AI 
uh, and it also kind of brings the benefits. And I, I wanted to focus a bit on, say, as part of that first point, also on the benefits. I mean, there is so much potential of AI in sectors which really need change. Energy, I mean, in Europe, I don't need to tell any European that kind of energy is absolutely critical. And we're still wasting a lot of our energy. Our energy efficiency is not good. Health, there's tremendous opportunities with rising health costs because of the demography to improve healthcare in Europe, personalized yep. healthcare, and contain these costs. Mobility, manufacturing, it was mentioned, agriculture, precision agriculture using AI can reduce uh, artificial fertilizer, can reduce the, the per, uh, pesticides, improve the quality of the, of the harvest. So also in those areas, we need to make sure that AI, where, where there is a very strong public sector dimension that AI is deployed and, and, and not just like, I mean, I'm here in, in San Francisco, there's a lot of AI in social media for algorithms and content moderation. I think we would like to see it also in areas that really matter, if you, I mean, matter to, to our as societies. Climate change is one statistics. If we use AI and technologies better, we can cut the current CO2 emissions by at least 15%, just simply with the technologies that we have available today. So that's the first point. We need to get our act together. I think the, the, the second point is uh, it isn't just about AI. I was interested in hearing uh, Greg talk actually about data. Uh, I mean, AI without data is, is, well, isn't going to bring us the benefits that we, we, we need. I mean, AI without data, without supercomputing capacities, isn't going to give us the benefits. So we need to think about the whole ecosystem, the, the technologies around. We will get a lot more data also from IoT, for example, but Europe has a data problem. Uh, we don't have enough data available. I mean, you look at the US, you have the big platforms, they have a, a huge mountains of data. You look at China, there's the government of China, I mean, for reasons which we all know, has huge amounts of data available on which they can train, on which they can improve their AI. This is a handicap that Europe needs to overcome. So together with the member states, we're building what we call data spaces, bring the data together. We have also legislative instruments to ensure that data is well protected. I'd like to see in the next five years that when we talk about Europe, we talk, of course, continue to talk about data protection, but we talk about data use and data valorization as well. We cannot just be successful in, in, in the world of today and in the world of tomorrow only by protecting data. We need also to use data and data is therefore at, at, at the core of becoming a successful AI continent with trustworthy AI applications. Last point about cooperation with the US. Um, this is of course also one of the reasons why we are here, why the EU has opened an office here and why we are discussing very closely with the US in the context of the Trade and Technology Council issues around AI. I mean, we agree with the US on the problem analysis. We agree on what we want AI to look like, I mean, how, how it should respect our fundamental rights and our, our values, the AI Bill of Rights that was issued only a few weeks ago by the US, I mean, is a, almost a carbon copy of what we have in the AI Act. The only difference being the AI will be binding at some point. The AI Bill of, Bill of Rights is, sets a, a direction. Um, industry is working very closely together. I had a meeting with an important industry company here um, an AI company here, and they said half of the thousands of companies that they work with are European. Half of the app developers, more than half of the app developers of the tens of thousands they work with are European. So there's a lot of potential there for cooperation, to improve the cooperation. We also need the American investments into Europe. We have an investment problem. We still, we are doing much better on venture capital, but we are nearly where we need to be in order to valorize and to, to scale up the, the, the potential that we have in AI and in other areas where startups in, in, in deep tech, where startups are, are present. So that cooperation is going to be absolutely vital, particularly in this dangerous world where we are at the moment. We, we, we must lead on AI. The democratic countries in the world must lead on AI. We cannot allow the Chinese to lead or the Russians to lead on, on AI. So those were the three points I wanted to make. I hope I stayed within the four minutes that, minutes that you allocated, and it was a real pleasure to be with you. <laughs> Gerard, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that. I really do. Um, so before we move on, uh, I just want to let you know, 
we are measuring the success of this session, at least me personally, on the value of the content. Don't judge me on time management, at least not tonight. Um, but if it's good content, I like to listen to it. But I also want to say that what I really like with these kind of sessions is we already announced that we will have the third EU AI summit in March. And I promise everybody we will revisit all the content and all the statements that was made today. And then let's look at a scorecard and let's, you know, let's look at what has really happened over the last or over the next months. And then we are going over the next years and see how we actually track the progress in, in Europe. So with that said, let's go into a, a very interesting topic. And I have to say last week in London, two days ago in Berlin, every time in a startup environment, if you have VCs showing up, the energy goes up and the interest level goes up. So with that and no further ado, we have three incredible individuals, all of them I highly respect. We have Jasper Mazeman from partner at HV Capital here from Germany. We have Lydia Devisheva. She is with Next 47. She's based in uh, San Francisco, but she is you know, investing across the Atlantic. And then we have Katya Almaskri from General Partner at Open Ocean, one of the uh, most active uh, pan-European uh, venture capital firms as well. So with that, uh, Jasper, if you would well, like to take over. Jasper, are you there? Hello. Can you Hello. Hear me? You are traveling <laughs> too, right? Yeah, kind of. I'm at the Baltic Sea. I'm enjoying uh, the only a few advantages of climate change. Uh, so it's pretty warm here, I must say, 18 degrees. Good. Four minutes. Go ahead. In the middle right. of your vacation, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm working with HB Capital. We manage about two billion in money, uh, more than uh, 20 years old, actually 22 years. So one of the first uh, German VCs and, and raised a significant amount of capital now investing out of a 550 million fund. Um, what we do is we like to back seed stage companies, which means people come with an idea. Um, maybe they have one or two customers, uh, maybe they have a bit more traction, we can now invest a bit later, but we like to be one of the first institutional investors. There are a lot of companies from Germany, but I also back companies from Israel, Spain, uh, the Nordics, uh, Amsterdam, so we invest across Europe. Um, we try to help scaling the business, but first finding the product market fit for the idea, so we're very heavily involved, um, and because of that, uh, AI was very interesting, uh, like seven years ago when I started investing in the topic. So the first topic was actually accounting automation. So there was a team that said, hey, we've come from SumUp, we've done, we've dealt with all the payments that uh, those small shops would do every day. But the big, big issue was actually accounting and accounting is a very manual thing, very repetitive rule base. Why can't we solve this somehow? And uh, they came across a solution called artificial intelligence at the time. Um, so it was very new. They didn't find anyone in Germany, by the way. It's a German team, two German founders. So they went uh, across the ocean, San Francisco to expensive. And then Israel at the time was still okay. Um, and this is how the team was built. And this is how I came to AI. And after that, I invested in eight more companies applying AI. The largest is actually from Israel, but that doesn't mean that Israel is the ecosystem. A couple are in Berlin and Amsterdam um, and the Nordics. The interesting part for me was during that journey, that it was obviously, as you probably know, the people were always coming from the problem uh, they tried to solve. And then they figured out that not just normal statistics would help, but they need a bit more because of the vast amount of data, the vast amount of problems to be solved, but also the, the patterns and the repeatability uh, around the problem that was occurring and solved by human beings. And the second interesting part was, it wasn't just replacing those people, but it was actually about making those people better. So the AI would recommend, and then uh, you would give an answer, you would correct the AI, which is kind of labeling and was great for scaling the business. Nowadays, when we look from HV Capital, we look at AI businesses and the latest investment was in cybersecurity in Amsterdam, a company called Hadrian. And um, they, they go for the new trend of uh, attack surface management. So they look the outside of a couple company, but there are so many entry points for hackers and they are actually hackers, that you have to train a scraper with AI based on what hackers are doing to do this efficiently. 
So another one of those use cases where you try to find the patterns, but you create data and you create certain, I would say, uh, unique data set yourself. I mean, we spoke about data and the importance of data before. So we look at uh, three different things. First one is how proprietary is the data you will be working with? And this might clash with some ideas we see in the European Union. But the big thing, obviously, about uh, data and AI is if I have my labeled data, if I can work on with that labeled data and I train my models on that, that's a certain unique selling proposition a competing company can't offer. So this is very important for us. But it's not the data itself. It's really the labeling, annotation, and the understanding of the data part. So how much does the customer help me with that? How scalable is it? And how much uniqueness will, can I keep in-house by myself? This is one very important part that we're looking for. It shouldn't be too manual. The second part, and, and this is the tough one, is really the talent. We mentioned it before. So how much do the people actually know what they're doing there? Why is Jasper AI? You might have heard of it. And by the way, disclaimer, I'm not involved there. It's my name, but somebody stole it. It's But it's a pretty sm smart move um, of applying GPT-3, so NLP, um, in, a, in a business model, but it's not their technology. So the problem, they will probably have very high cost in-house, in um, but they have found a business case because they, they understand how to apply it, but they don't know how to build it themselves. We try to find people who actually know how to build it themselves, who have been building NLP, NLU before, as an example, or ASR or whatever you might want to, uh, want to know. Because we believe that there should be certain proprietary uh, knowledge behind it. And finding those talent is tough. And the third part is really about looking at people who try to sell this product uh, and, and, and see the business case and want to earn a lot of money with it. So we would rather back, and this sounds maybe a bit boring to some people in the audience, we would rather back a founder that goes with a very simple ASR and says, hey, it's fine, it's 80% accurate, we solve the rest with freelancers like Verbit AI is doing from Israel. But then I can focus totally on go-to-market, I can focus totally on workflow building and the product. And that's more important than actually creating the best AI in the world. So that's kind of the things as HV Capital we're looking at because we have to go for fast scaling businesses that we can sell in five years. That's how we think about it. Um, but there is so there are so many cases, so much potential in AI right now. As long as people don't over focus on the product building and the data science part, but really on the total business and making shortcuts. We don't need the best AI. We just need the AI that solves problems. Thank you. Jasper, thank you very much. Um, I think he nailed it in explaining the importance of data and models. And uh, as I said earlier, it directly relates to our November 29th session, where Greg is actually giving many, many more use cases like earlier what he did with, with New York. So please um, have a look at it. Uh, with that, uh, Lydia, uh, welcome back. Uh, we just talked to each other with each other 48 hours ago. So I appreciate you are taking another day or another evening this week for another session of ours. My, my pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for having me and uh, really enjoy uh, the, the audience. And I got a lot of good feedback from the participants in Berlin. So excited to, to hear yeah. from you again. Um, I'm Lydia. I'm a venture capital investor at Next47. We're based in San Francisco. We're a venture capital firm with uh, $2 billion under management. And we've been around for about five years. We're currently investing our out of our second fund, which is also a billion dollars. Uh, and we invest across the US, Europe, and Israel. Uh, so looking globally, um, not only at AI, but looking broadly at the B2B space. Uh, for us, that means enterprise software, developer infrastructure, um, AI and machine learning, both horizontal and vertical applications of AI, and then also frontier tech startups. Um, we usually look at A, B, and C rounds. So that means um, I like to see companies that have revenue, you know, early product market fit. Uh, we deploy checks that are five to 35 million, and uh, we have about 45 investments of which uh, a third are unicorns. And some names you might recognize on the European side, we've invested in companies like Sender, Alaiko, Cargo.one, Blink, and Vandalbots. Uh, I'm on the board of Vandalbots, a company in Dresden that I'm really proud of. Uh, the way we support our companies is through our go-to-market team, and that's a team uh, with quota-based reps that uh, we pay the salaries and commissions, and they sell on behalf of, of every company we invest in. 
Uh, a couple of areas uh, that I wanted to talk to you about today and areas that I'm really excited about uh, are AI and machine learning and modern data tools, but applied to very antiquated analog industries. So uh, I'm most excited about areas like logistics and supply chain, manufacturing, construction, energy, or transportation. And if you're working on a solution in any of these areas, would love to hear from you and please, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I've previously invested across the full kind of stack of technologies in deep tech and, and AI, uh, including autonomous driving sensors, 3D printing, mobility platforms, logistics software. And something I wanted to talk to you today about, which uh, is something I've been thinking a lot lately, is kind of the state of the market and how to raise money if you're building an AI startup or, or any startup, actually. Uh, we've heard several times today and in the last couple of months that we might be heading for some rough seas and what some might call a recession. Uh, well, well, I don't really know what that means or you know the severity and duration of that. Uh, we actually, um, uh, for, for startups, the advice we give is that startups have to adjust to this uh, new, new economic reality and kind of the new um, way the market will work in the, whether it's in the next six months or next year or, or even a bit longer. Um, the VC funds, funds like ours, are in a strange place right now. VC, uh, the venture industry, has the most dry powder, so the most capital it's ever had. Uh, currently, there's $290 billion sitting in the bank accounts of VCs uh, ready to be deployed. And that's that amount is up 50% from only two years ago, so the beginning of the pandemic. What, what we're seeing, though, and what is a little bit scary is that venture funding is down 50% year over year. So Q3 venture funding compared to 2021. Uh, VC, what is uh, happening, and I'm seeing this at our fund as well, is VCs are reser reserving a lot of their capital for some of their most promising companies in their portfolio uh, that they want to support during the difficult times and, and maybe during the, the recession that might be coming. Uh, what... If you're building an AI startup right now, and that's a pre-seed or seed company, I would say you don't need to worry because you're still so far away from uh, an exit or from going public or being acquired uh, that right now is really a, a great time to actually focus on product, to focus on you know growing the business. There will be so much talent from you know layoffs and, and companies that are not able to support all these engineers and, and really talented people. Now is the time to uh, to get to to hire these people and help. Uh, and get them on board to build your, your product, whether that's in AI or, or elsewhere. Um, what's happening now, and, and that's interesting in the market, is we're looking at the public markets. We're seeing even the best companies trade at, for example, a fraction of, of the revenue multiples that they were trading last year. And so last year, we were seeing public companies trade at 30, 40 times revenue. We're seeing now that's anywhere from six to 10 times revenue, even the really fastest growing Companies with spectacular revenue, spectacular margins in the public markets are still trading at several times less. Uh, and we as venture investors uh, also have to make an adjustment in how we value companies in the private markets. So when I look at a startup that's a series B or C, um, there's no way like last year where people uh, were paying 80 to 100 times the, the revenue. They were valuing companies that as much as a company that had a million of revenue was valued at $100 million uh, of post-money valuation. That's not unfortunately happening. Uh, even if it's AI, even if it's generative AI, if it's uh, clean tech, kind of any of the sectors that are really hyped, uh, we're, we're seeing across the board uh, kind of a full correction of, of valuations and uh, of multiples that investors are willing to pay. Um, another kind of very quick uh, topic that, that I wanted to touch on, especially around AI, is um, we basically we we as investors and and me personally in my my approach in selecting companies I don't look at AI just for the sake of like oh AI is cool and I would like to invest in the next you know the next hype or the next uh, trend uh, or what whatever everyone's talking about I want to see companies that invest in something that is um, solving a true problem and. If I have one piece of advice for you today that is obsessed with your customer and obsessed with your customer's problems, uh, solve a problem that is very acute in the market and focus on that. Find a subset of customers you that are ready to adopt your solution because they cannot exist without that solution. 
Um, what a colleague of mine says, and, and I like that quote, is don't build a vitamin, but a painkiller. So don't build a product that's a nice to have, but a product that's a must have, and your customers will have to adopt it no matter what, because it, they just need it in their workflow and it, it truly solves one of their issues. Um, if you're embedding AI in that solution, that can make it even more powerful, then you have uh, a data advantage, you have um, a solution that allows your customer to predict uh, maybe their, their parts of their business. But what is uh, important is to be able to, under, to explain and to uh, kind of convince your customer that this black box that is the AI actually works, whatever algorithm you've built, whatever data sources you have. Um, so oftentimes I always ask AI companies to tell me, hey, like, what are the results? What are your true positives? What are your false negatives? What are your false positives? Like, how well does this algorithm work? And not only how well does it work today, but how is it trending over time? Like, can you show me that your model is improving? Can you show me you correctly predicted your customers' outcomes? Um, so AI is very powerful. And my advice is to focus on the practical, uh, build, build a solution and focus on fundamentals of the business. I, no matter if it's um, an AI business or not, always um, look at the fundamentals like unit economics, LTV over CAC, uh, and creating a sustainable business. Thank, thanks a lot. Lydia, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your time again this week and uh, sharing your wisdom. Um, Katya, are you, are you on? Um, general partner, Open Ocean, based in London. Yes. Thank you, Tom. Thank hello. you. Yes, hello. Do you hear me? And yes. hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me today. So I'm a general partner at Open Ocean. We are based in Helsinki in London, and we invest um, in cutting-edge technologies across Europe. We have two passions. One passion is to build a fair and sustainable data economy. Um, so we do believe that building a data economy is a must these days, but we need to do it in a way that, inclu is, that includes the society in, at large and that creates some economy that is sustainable so we can live with it for a long time. The other passion that we have is building global leaders out of Europe. Um, we do believe that we can build Googles and, and Cisco's and so up out of Europe. We have created my, my SQL company and my ADB, TrueCaller uh, and Grafco and many more out of Europe. And we do believe that we there is potential to do a lot more. We have seen stories like DeepMind where there was a potential to build a global AI platform out of Europe. Uh, it was acquired too early. And we do always advocate to bring more capital uh, to back European talent, actually to build those companies and, and make them successful. Um, so uh, let's talk about a few topics. Uh, I know that time is uh, short, so I, I will try to take actually uh, less time, but three topics I wanted to address. The first one is actually we talked about data and um, there were a few comments about you know GDPR and, and other things and how Euro Europe is creating policy around data. And we do believe that again, here we have to be fair, um, but what we are seeing today is that AI is mainly driven out of the US and China. And unfortunately, because of GDPR, uh, a lot of data sets are excluded from Europe. So AI, a lot of AI algorithms are trained, um, uh, let's say on the US data sets um, and creates potentially bias, uh, which excludes Europe. So on the venture capital side, what we are seeing that actually data is very, very costly. There are big enterprises, uh, let's say retail, that sits on a lot of data, which is very bad quality, and they actually are struggling how to use it. And there are small startups that are trying to create innovative solutions, but data is so expensive, they cannot access it. Sometimes European startups have to go to India <clears throat> to actually get some data to train their algorithms. So when we talk about not only venture capital, but European policy and support of governments, uh, we do believe that there should be an effort to make data more accessible. And by this, we'll create a much more fair and sustainable data economy. Uh, so this is point number one. Point number two um, is about bringing AI actually to broader consumption. So we invest uh, in a lot of AI. I actually, you know, I have graduated in artificial intelligence. And in 90s, uh, my master's degree was around fuzzy logic. You can imagine the journey I have done in the last 20 plus years. 
Uh, and of course, deep learning was, um, you know, a great breakthrough in 2006. <laughs> so since then, we are all investing much more in AI. It became computationally possible. Um, but the problem stays um, that actually today AI is not broadly used by enterprises. Uh, and there are many, many issues. One of them is trust to the models that AI uh, is building. And actually to scale up artificial intelligence, we need to find ways to make these models more trustable and reliable. And this is something that industry is just starting to look into. Uh, we have just announced our latest investment yesterday in a startup, which is a spin out from Itihad Zurich, which is called Latest Flow. This startup is looking into it and we believe they can build a global solution to solve this problem. But actually this is something that where we can also unite our efforts and create a platform that is a global leader in this sense. The third one, I think, the third one I want to address is infrastructure. Actually, artificial intelligence is very expensive in terms of infrastructure. And again, there is a prohibitive cost. There are large companies like Google, like OpenAI, uh, and many others who have built their extensive infrastructure internally, and they can actually progress and continue to innovate on this infrastructure. Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of other enterprises, let's say a long tail of enterprises, they don't have this. And of course, as, as a VC, we are looking always to, for breakthrough solutions and, and innovators who can create affordable infrastructure uh, for other players to start to be real players in, in artificial intelligence uh, stage. But still, it's it's a big, big problem. So my, uh, I have invested in Graphco. I remember Graphco, um, back in 2016 when they started, um, I had actually a thesis. I was investing on behalf of Samsung back then. And I had the thesis that actually computation is very, very hard for AI. And, and NVIDIA chip is great, but it's not solving the most innovative part of, of artificial intelligence. So we needed something. And it was very hard to find capital for GraphQL. And indeed, so I do believe there are only a few places in the world where such innovation can happen and Bristol and Dresden in Germany are two places where such innovation can happen, but it was really hard and, and people didn't believe simply that semiconductors can be built in, in Europe. So I think one of the things that we can also collectively address is bringing more capital to those innovators in Europe, but also making sure that we are building infrastructure that is affordable uh, largely for other enterprises for the future and not just prohibitive as cost. So these are three points, and I want to stop here because I know the time is scarce these days, but would be happy to elaborate if we have more opportunities to talk. Katya, thank you very much. Um, I know you just scratched the surface with your experiences, and I would be happy to invite you back for a deeper dive session uh, over the next few months. So thank you very much. Um, I know that we are running really late. Uh, we are actually expecting the uh, Bavarian Minister of Science and arts as well as the uh, award ceremony. Before we go there, I would like to open the floor just a few more minutes for three absolutely incredible individuals. Um, I have the pleasure knowing all of them extremely well. Um, they're all CEOs who have done it, have been there, done it multiple times. Uh, we have Suryak Roding, he's a German, lives in Silicon Valley, he's the co-founder and CEO of Early. He's also a founder and investor at uh, Roding Ventures. There's David Carmona, and uh, he's a general manager at Microsoft, deeply involved in artificial intelligence. And then there's Lutz Finger. He is with a medical company. He's also an author, a physicist. He talked two days ago, and he just blew everybody's mind away with the expertise that he brings. So bear with me, please. Uh, three more people, and then we have the ceremony, and then we have... Um, a cold beer that we all well deserved. So, Suryak, uh, welcome to uh, the session. Hi there. I hope you're still there. Great Excellent. To be there. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. So, I'm going to talk about something very different. Uh, Thomas asked me to uh, address those in the room who are want to be entrepreneurs, who are thinking about maybe it's time for me to do something. Maybe it's time for me to jump um, sort of like off the cliff and into the unknown and start a company. And when you are thinking about those things, I, I, 
I wonder how many people in the room are thinking about that. Uh, perhaps you can raise your hand. And Thomas tells me how many people raise their hand. Are there, are there, any, are there to, any hands going on? I tell you what, I'm in the middle of an incubator kind of a guy. So there's a lot of startups here, a lot of wannabe founders and probably are real founders. Real founders. Okay, good. So I, I want to address a couple of the um, questions, the most burning questions that people always always uh, uh, usually have on their minds when they're thinking about doing this. The first qu question is, should you start a company? And the answer to that question really depends on uh, whether you can do one important thing, which is to acknowledge your fear and then act anyway. <laughs> So imagine, uh, I don't know if you remember the day when Barack Obama declared his candidacy for president, sit, standing in Iowa on a really cold morning in January um, of um, uh, uh, back then in, in 2008. Uh, and he declared running for president. And most people didn't take that very seriously because he wasn't really well known and he was a very junior senator. Um, and most people, when they look at a person like that, who then becomes president, they assume that uh, these people are just so beyond me, they are not afraid of anything. They just go for it. They never, they never fear any fear, fear. And people like to talk about the fearless leaders. And the reality is, I don't believe that for one second. I think everyone is afraid of doing things they don't know of things that are hard to do. The difference is some people can ignore their fear and act anyway, and others can't. And now the question is, why would you ignore your fear? Because isn't the fear actually very useful? It's useful to some extent when you're walking towards a cliff and you're wondering, oh, I'm kind of afraid to take one more step. Well, that's pretty good fear to have because it saves your life. But most of the time, your fear is actually rooted in some really ancient things that, you know, sort of instincts that are in our, decoded into our DNA that are supposed to protect us from killing ourselves. But in reality, in most of our choices that we're making nowadays, it's not about physical or bodily harm. So if you have fear, ask yourself, is it about actually being potentially damaged in term physically damaged or not? And if the answer is no, then most of the time you should acknowledge your fear and then act anyway. And the trick is not to wait for the time when the fear will go away or you've overcome it anyway. And I bet that Barack Obama was fearful that morning as well when he had declared his candidacy. He just did it anyway. And this is probably one of the most profound insights I've ever had in my life that I was lucky to get taught about 20 years ago. And I believe if you, if you have that single takeaway from this conversation, uh, it was, it was life-changing for me. I think you can go very far if you savor that idea. Acknowledge your fear, then act anyway. Then once you've done that, assume you've actually taken that plunge in your head why would anyone invest in you? Why should anyone invest in you? And the answer to that question lies in another question that I would recommend you ask yourself. If you were the one who needed to put $10 million down of your own money, imagine you had that money, but not much more. Imagine you had 15 million and out of the, 10, out of the 15, you have to take $10 million dollars and invest them in yourself. What would make you invest in yourself? In other words, is there anything really unusual about you? What are you really unusually good at? To the extent that you're almost better than anyone else in that specific thing, what is that? What makes you really different? That's what investors wanna know. And that's what you need to pitch. Third, how should you lead once you are running a company? And here, similar to acknowledging your fear and then acting anyway, 
This is a slightly different take on this. Don't lead by fear of failing. Lead by the will to win. It's profoundly different. If you're trying to avoid failure, you are more likely to fail. You need to lead by the will to win. And especially when things are not looking good. Because then it, when, it's, when things are looking good, it's easy to do that. It's not easy to do that when things are not looking good. But you will see how it frees your mind from this fear of failing that is, that is so imminent in all of us. Number four, a calm flow state is what you should try to accomplish, not a frantic mode. A flow state is when you can simply act and you're really em embedded and immersed in what you do. Be highly focused, be highly capable, no drama, full teamwork. And the last question is, how do you pick your investors? And there, the one advice I have for you is, raising money is really about raising alliances. It's who you raise the money from, not which money you raise. It's very important to pick the right people to provide the money, even if the valuation might be a little lower. If you have a better investor, that's the way to go because you're building an alliance and you have the opportunity to reel some really good people in by offering them a place to invest in. So try to build not just a bank account, build an alliance. I'm going to stop here because I know we have limited time. Siri, I, thank you very much. And I'm just, I, I just sitting here and every time I, you say something in a presentation like this, I could listen to you forever because you have some really good advice. And I can feel it in this room that people like listening to every word that you say. So Siri, thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Glad to be David. there. Thank you guys and hope you enjoy the conference. Uh, I, will I will show you later. David, are you on? I am here, Thomas. How are you doing? Here we go. I'm very good. Go uh, ahead. Let me, yeah, thank you. Let me share uh, just a couple of slides. I will be super, super brief because I know that we are running out of time because uh, I just want to land one message, Thomas, to everybody uh, listening. And that message is that we all know, we are all aware of a second AI revolution that is happening now, that is starting to happen now. But my point, the one that I want to land today is that we are missing the point of what that revolution is about. And let me explain that a little bit. So you all have heard about the massive uh, new changes that are coming to AI based on these new capabilities of new architectures that are enabling massive models, right? Models of billions of parameters. You see that exponential curve that we have seen like radically different from the, the stable uh, number of parameters and size that we have seen in models. Now, suddenly in the last four years, we're seeing an explosion of these models. And yes, they are based on new capabilities, new neural network architectures. They are trained on cloud AI supercomputers. They are based on massive unsupervised data that we're feeding into this model. And we are all amazed of what these models can achieve, right? So if you've seen the headlines on the amazing capabilities that are coming from these models, but my point today is that don't get walled by those capabilities. The real revolution that these models are gonna enable is quite different. And it has to do with the nature of those models. It has to do with this. Let me just show you one thing. So if you look at traditionally how we have developed AI, it's always very similar, right? So it's about creating a model that is trained on a subset, on a data set that is particular for a particular task and a particular domain. So we train the model and then we can run that model for that particular task in that particular domain. Now you change the task or you change the domain and you have to retrain that model. You have to think of a different model and a different data set to train that model on. What these models are enabling is a different approach to this. So what we see is that these models can be yes, they can be trained on much more data. So they need much more data to be, to be trained on. But then once you have that, it has two unique capabilities. The first one is that they are multimodal, meaning that they can not only 
be trained on one particular modality like text of images, but all at the same time. And what that means is that we're able to create a new uh, way of, of creating these models that can really combine these modalities in a way that is useful for us. But then the second important thing is that they are multitask and multi-domain. What that means is that once I do the job of training these models in this massive data, then I can customize that model just with my domain expertise. And that's a huge change. That means that I don't need to recreate the model for every task and every domain that I want to apply that model on. And what is even more interesting is that in some cases, like for example, the new training these models called zero-shot learning, we're able to do this customization in an interactive way. So somebody without deep knowledge of data science can customize these models for the task and the domain that they want to apply that model on. And that is a game changer. So that is something that will dramatically change the way that we develop AI. And it will do it in, in this way. So right now we look at AI as a go-to function in every company, right? So you usually have this AI department or the center of excellence, depending on, on, on the company that you are on. In the future, we're gonna see that instead of being that bottleneck where we go to uh, execute a particular AI, AI task, what we will see is moving into this concept of AI being a platform in a company, just like software it is today. So you don't see software such centralized in a company, you see it more as a platform for all the business units to build on top of. So that concept of AI as a platform will be something that will redefine the way that you can help companies to develop their AI strategy. And then the next thing that we will also see, which is even more relevant, is the concept of the intelligence worker. So let me explain that concept a little bit. So you are all familiar with intelligence or with the information worker that we have today. So employees using technology to reason on top of data. What we will see in the future is the intelligence worker. So employees, co-reasoning with AI on top of that data. And that will democratize AI in a way that we haven't seen before. So huge opportunity for players who want to embrace that, uh, that way of that revolution of AI in the future. I will, I will stop here. <laughs> thank you, Thomas. And thank you for having me here. I so much appreciate that. <laughs> I will call you back at another session. David, thank you very much. Uh, let's quickly over to, to Lutz. Uh, if you can pick on one thing that you would like to convey, I would appreciate that because we have some uh, interesting people also outside waiting for the ceremony. Totally Lutz. fine. And, and Hello. <clears throat> good evening to, um, to Munich. Uh, or guten Abend. So one, one thing to convey, I think we heard, and the this is an amazing panel you put together, Thomas. We, we heard different um, ideas, right? David talked it's about there has been... Can you hear me? No? Yes? Yeah, yeah. It creates an echo. Let's close the door. Let's keep it close. Go ahead. Sorry. No worries. No worries. Okay. I like It's an amazing panel, what, what we guys heard. Um, David actually was um, pretty neatly pointing out something has changed in the industry. Um, uh, Jasper actually pointed out how to bring this together in, a, in terms of a business modeling. And I can only stress this. So I'm I'm the president of a product and technology for a healthcare company. We use AI. Okay, let's keep it like this. I build up the population health team um, for Google. We used AI. I helped Snapchat going public. We used AI. So it is it, you know AI is a tool set. And what everybody at the moment get excited about it. And I, we, we can talk about the technology. The best thing is everybody of you just open uh, like open AI, uh, get yourself an account and play around with GPT-3 or play around with DALI. Figure it out what, what this is. Um, Technology-wise, yes, there have been certain changes to make this better, make this more. But the fundamental problem hasn't changed. AI needs to solve a problem. AI needs to be making something better. And the best way to think about this is Facebook did not start with AI. Facebook solved a problem of connecting people, right? And that, that's the thing they do. And very often people look at those big um, tech companies and saying, oh, they have so much data and they have so much AI and they have so much capability. But that's actually not what their business model is. The business model is they change a problem. And once they figure this out, then they scale it up 
using better technology. Once they figured out how to make money, they make it better and they make it more and they drill in. What you see very often in all of those technology think tanks, and I inherited part of the healthcare deep mind team um, uh, at Google, and I felt like as I build out the population health effort there, is very often those think tanks build amazing models, but what goes into production is actually very simple. And you can see this for like Netflix talked about this very openly. They said, well, yeah, we, we can do deep learning and deeper learning and like complicated things. It's actually logistic regression. And you start saying, oh, logistic regression, hold on. I can't do that. Do it. So my single <clears throat> only advice is don't get carried away by those three waves of excitement for AI. It's out there. It's a tool. And it's enabling us to do many, many things which we couldn't do before. But keep core to solving a business problem. Keep core to changing the world. Um, uh, and keep core to focusing on your customers. And keep core to creating, creating value. If you do that, AI will be your friend along the path. But don't start your business case, and I'm an angel investor by myself, with, oh, I do AI walking on water ain't working because who cares like is walking on water something which the world needs then yes ai might be cool to do this start simple scale big dream bigger thanks lutz that was good thanks for getting to the point i know and uh, with that i would say uh, i would love to welcome mr marcus blume the Bavarian Minister of Science and the Arts, as well as Professor Matthias Notz, the CEO of the German Entrepreneurship. So, and my apology again for, but it's good content. So let's let's face it, right? Matthias, hi. Very nice to meet you. Hi, my pleasure. Very nice to meet you. I sit there. All right. So, um, are you wired, or you have a microphone? Do you don't have the? Okay. May we get a second mic? Maybe that would be great. And with that, I don't even want to talk too much. Um, you gentlemen have a lot to share. Um, you have awards to give out. Um, there is a presentation that I'm looking at. And in fact, if you gentlemen, who is giving the presentation? I, this sorry. is the clicker. Yeah. But that one controls that screen, not this one. So I'm trying to keep up with you. So you can look here, but just I click. It's complicated. Thanks, Thomas, not only for that, <laughs> but also for the invitation. <laughs> You're very welcome. Yeah, uh, it's my pleasure to, to, to be here. And I think we do it fast because uh, I just learned that people are waiting. And I'm also curious on the, on the prices. Um, I'm talking about the AI Beyond Borders Award. And, and I'm um, Matthias Notz, obviously, and next to me, um, Markus uh, Blume. And um, I'm CEO of German Entrepreneurship, and we know for yeah. quite a while. And yeah. it's it's great that we are part of that European AI Summit. Thanks for that. And um, um, giving such an award to German AI startups is important to us, and we are grateful to do that. Not we. You will do that in a in a second. And um, you control uh, that one. I con oh, you went backwards. I went backwards. That's not. Yeah, here we go. There. Here we go. Look there. Um, uh, just an I idea. I could do 30 minutes. I do 30 seconds. I think German entrepreneurship. I think it's about startup and startup power. We love startups. And it's important that we have more startups in Germany. That's yeah. one of our mission. And even more scale ups. That's even more important, I think. And the AI sector is one of the promising fields where we can create a lot of scale ups. And that's why we run a lot of programs in munich our hometown berlin dusseldorf but also in silicon valley you met my colleagues there a while ago good idea um greetings from hedy as well and then also in singapore so i think building that network and our main program is german accelerator oliver schramm mentioned it already and we build an ai competence center ai competence center is doing a lot of things but one is giving an award to great great uh, german ai startups and yeah i present now what they get um 
The first place gets 25,000 euros in cash, 15,000 second place, third place 10,000 and additional activities like the one year membership in KI Park where we are founding member that they have uh, can join the internationalization program of German Accelerator and so on, you can read it. But it's important for us that it's, it recognizes the value of the German startups and the scaling potential, not only the, not the technology, but that, that, that they push the borders, not only the technology push the borders, but also that they go beyond borders uh, going abroad and especially to Silicon Valley or Singapore. That's the award. We will hand it over. There are three finalists. I will hand over to you in a second. They don't know the the, the ranking. The, the ranking. The ranking. Yeah, they are here, um, and now it's a pleasure, honor, to hand over to you, Marcus, to be the presenter, moderator, for uh, for our award. Wow! Thank you, thank you, Matthias, and thank you, Thomas, and thank you. To all the guys out there, um, I'm very much honored um, that I have the um, possibility to be here, uh, to be here together with you. Um, I feel that this uh, topic that I is really important, that is key, and I just walked around here and uh, had so many contacts to people that are really inspiring with what they are doing with their ideas, and um, that gives me the feeling that. Indeed, everything today is about technology and talents. And this is maybe at the key of uh, everything. And for that reason, it's very important to have such conferences like the AI Summit. So thank you to the organizers. Thank you for all your efforts to bring this group here together, uh, here in Munich. And um, of course, also out there in the world. Uh, hello to uh, the Silicon Valley and all the other guys spent a couple of days or even weeks um, this summer in California, we uh, came to the conclusion that there are very much um, of uh, the bunch of sim similarities between California and Bavaria, especially um, the weather is a little bit better here and there. <laughs> the people are smarter than everywhere. Uh, <laughs> and um, the key difference might be we have the better beer here in Bavaria. That so is true. We have uh, really happy guys here uh, around in Munich. And I'm really very happy to um, having you all here and um, maybe um, allowing me to just say two or three sentences about Germany and Bavaria um, with our focus on new technologies and especially AI. Uh, so we just established a program here in uh, Bavaria. That's a little commercial now. Um, we established just a program of 3.5 billion uh, of strengthening our universities, uh, strengthening the ecosystem with the idea of bringing the brightest and the smartest minds uh, to Bavaria. So we um, strengthened our, or we are about to strengthen our universities with uh, 1,000 new chairs, uh, 100 designated to the field of AI, AI and mobility, AI and production, AI and health, AI and energy, so everything what is uh, around there. And uh, for that reason, I feel it's a very wise and clever decision to start with this summit here uh, in Munich. So again, welcome and thank you for your, all your efforts. And now I feel it's getting really important. Uh, you said uh, we have now three startups, the finalists uh, who are going to give now a final pitch. And after this, we should know who is number one, two, three, right? Yes, yes. Let's start with... Hey, Mato. Hey, Why don't you come over here, sit come over here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Should I begin? Yeah, you see that. All right. Perfect. You or someone you know will develop an immune disorder such as blood cancer. Every year, millions of patients receive the wrong treatment because of subjectivity and human mistakes in the analysis of immune data. Diagnosticians have to spend countless hours of tedious labor to look for abnormalities in the immune systems of their patients. And every year, these immune data is getting ever com more complex at a daunting pace, already surpassing human understanding. But what if we could build an AI tool that brings both subjectivity and manual labor to zero? We have, and it's called Hemato. Yeah. 
Hematose is a CE marked FDA listed diagnostic support software for blood cancer and other immune disorders using an AI immune phenotyping platform. The doctor simply uploads the data from their normal machine and then Hematose deep learning algorithms process the raw single cell data to highlight the specific abnormalities of their patient's immune system and give accurate and specific diagnostic recommendations. And once they're ready, the information simply flows back into the laboratory database for a seamless workflow. workflow. With Hemato, making an analysis is lightning fast, so doctors no longer have to work until late at night. With Hemato's data pipelines, uh, they are objective, so patients do not get the wrong treatment. And unlike humans, Hemato can ingest all the data, so a doctor can see the full picture of their patient's immune system. Initially, we're targeting clinical labs that want to accelerate their blood cancer diagnostic workflows, like one of our early adopters, Sonic Healthcare. This is a market of 200 million RR. Then, whether it's pre, during, or post treatment, we'll expand that to encompass diagnostics across the patient journey. And finally, by encompassing that entire patient journey, we can start changing the paradigm of monitoring and guiding the immune system to predicting and preventing. These follow-up markets combined make up a hundred billion ARR opportunity and would improve the treatment of millions of patients. I would like us to imagine a world whereby not just diagnostic error is reduced to zero, but even your treatment plan is personalized to your immune system. That is a world we are creating with Hematome. Wow. wow. Quite impressive. Well pitched. Well pitched. Thank you. We have the next slide. This one? There you go. Okay, let's go. So e-commerce um, is becoming a considerable threat to brick and mortar retail. Um, they have better in-store understanding, and this is not even this is not only a problem for retailers who work with very slim margins, but also for the city centers and towns that they do business in. Um, Already today, AI and computer vision have the tools so that physical brick and mortar retailers could build stores that are in no way inferior to their digital counterparts. They're just not adopting it yet. Um, so what would happen if they had the tools to bring this change about, which will mean their future in a way, at their own pace? So at Signatrix, we built a software platform that allows retailers to aggregate all their in-store data with a focus on computer vision and uh, video data, and then run easy to use AI and computer vision apps on top of that um, for various use cases, which is this map. Um, <laughs> could be security, could be theft, but it could also be things like improving operational efficiency or learning about customers' preferences, right? So stores can become more secure, better run, better for customers and more lucrative. So to give you an example, um, one of Europe's largest grocery retailer um, uses this technology in thousands of stores, saving millions of euros every month by um, providing a assistive system so their cashiers can actually detect fraud and theft. Um, basically by checking the contents of shopping carts and shopping baskets, they get immediately notified in case something get, goes wrong and they can act uh, when it matters. Computer vision only makes sense in aggregate. Every use case has a sort of marginal contribution, if you will, but in a, in a portfolio setting, if you act them together, it really moves the needle for retailers. So with this platform approach, we're basically bringing the cost of deployment, so the basically upfront marginal cost per use case, almost down to zero. So basically retailers get access to this technology. They can scale it, um, experiment with it, um, and it's easy. So. We work with um, international customers such as Edeka, Globus, but also Safeway and, and, and Joanne, who basically run this in over 4,000 locations. And it can work with every grocery store, uh, every grocery chain on the world, um, and has the possibility, or sort of could be extended to things like fashion, apparel, DIY, and, um, and so on. So I'm going to leave you with, you know, we live we live in a more and more digital world, but in the sense, um, um, it's still 
you know, they're still atoms, it's still physical. So um, in a sense, we're trying to sort of push forward how far software can go, you know, what it can touch so that maybe, you know, retailers could sell stuff at even better prices for customers and customer journeys and shopping experiences will be built around the people that actually use them. Thank you very much. Did they switch it, the sequence? Yeah. Thanks. As a company and as an engineer, you always want to achieve the best technical solution as possible. And for example, if you're a pump producing company, your pump should be real resistant, strong, and for sure energy efficient. And that is the one side. The other side are the customers. Your customers are pumping maybe water, which is a quite easy case, but there are also customers out there who would like to pump milk, honey, water with stones, and so on. And for all these customers uh, to achieve the best technical solution, your engineers have to do a lot of experiments day by day. And for sure, these experiments are costly and time consuming. And that is not only for the pump market that way. We see it also for different markets like stirrers, mixers, the whole polymer market. In all of these markets, engineers are running experiments to make their products better. And here we at Janus comes into the game. We build a fully automated cloud-based simulation framework, which we call Strömungsraum. Strömungsraum is to say that way, it's a digital lab for engineers where they can run their experiments in a cheap and fast way. For example, the pump, uh, which should pump honey, uh, sounds a little bit confusing, but you can make 30 variations, upload them to Strömungsraum and see which one is the best to achieve the best result for your customer. And that is only one part. The second part is that we put on our cloud, we put AI-based systems so that Strömungsraum also makes suggestions how your product can be better and how errors could be prevented. And with Strömungsraum, we already do 350,000 digital experiments a year with more than 140 customers all over Europe. And we save hell over energy and we also re we reduce CO2, CO2. This year we saved 35,000 tons of CO2 with uh, Strömungsraum. And that is only, uh, only one part. The second part is, I'm, I mean, I'm an engineer and I'm really proud of that. And I think we in Germany and we in Europe have the best engineering companies. Why we shouldn't also have the place where we have the biggest and strongest digital lab. Now, that is what we are building at the Janos. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Ready? Ready? And the winner is. <laughs> the next one is animated all at once both at once here we go second place is signatrix thank you congratulations much. thank you And now, surprise, surprise, <laughs> first place, Janos, yeah!
How do you feel? I'm I'm really happy. <laughs> <laughs> So I make the best out of 25,000 euros and all the other offerings. Um, congratulations to the three of you, but especially first place. The winner does not take it all this time, but you, you won it and congratulations on that. Thank you very much. <laughs> we will try our best. He said we will try our best. <laughs> so, uh, and so final picture. <laughs> so with that we've made it I, I would say we made it um let's not judge this by the time management i learned my lesson but i hope the content was um interesting to most of you hopefully to all of you uh, as I said earlier, we will keep track of what was said and what was committed to, and uh, we will be back in March. And uh, in between, we have many other online, uh, maybe even hybrid uh, sessions uh, deeper going into uh, AI topics. And with that, I think we all well, well deserved a cold beer. I can't wait. So with that, thank you very much, everybody. Oh, yeah, let's have a good picture.